Hi there, my name is Mason Wilder. I am a research specialist with the ACFE and I'm here with you today to uh, do the first or the inaugural version of what we hope will be a recurring monthly feature called Fraud News. We are going to be talking about some of the bigger fraud related headlines in the news recently and just try and talk a little bit about some of the context uh, around those stories and some takeaways for fraud examiners. Please feel free to interact in the comments if you wanna share some perspective or ask any questions and we will do our best to get to those questions or at least follow up with those. We will also be sharing some links to news stories about uh, these topics as we go and bear with us for any technical difficulties on our first go round. Uh, please feel free to let us know what worked, what didn't, and what you'd like to see in future iterations. So starting off, we're going to be talking about uh, Deutsche Bank. You may have heard that recently a number of their offices in Germany, including the headquarters in Frankfurt, were raided in a large coordinated police operation involving about uh, 170 officers, I think, and they were looking for evidence of money laundering and uh, information about use of secrecy jurisdictions or tax havens. So uh, the Deutsche Bank issued a couple statements on that day indicating that they were fully cooperating with authorities and that the probe was related to two employees and <clears throat> so this is one in a long line of recent high profile European money laundering sc scandals involving financial institutions. You're probably aware of the recent Danske Bank scandal involving their Estonian branch in which more than 235 billion or so uh, dollars worth of suspicious transactions passed through that branch. Deutsche Bank was one of the banks potentially implicated in handling some of those transactions, although it's not clear that that was what prompted the raid. There's also been large scandals involving Scandinavia's largest bank, Nordea Bank, for money laundering. Uh, I recently saw some implications for Credit Suisse in money laundering and actually uh, 18 of the top large or 20 largest European banks have been fined for money laundering offenses over the last decade. So this isn't exactly new, but just the latest in a string of really high profile anti or anti money laundering operations or money laundering scandals in Europe. So there's been some reaction to this and these other scandals recently. Uh, the European Union discussed uh, some potential legislative reforms to bank supervision requirements, although apparently EU finance ministers last week agreed to kind of shelve those proposals in favor of an action plan uh, that does not involve legislative reforms but will not kick in for a while because the first stage of that action plan is about six months worth of reviewing some of these recent fraud scandals. There also in the UK, there have been a couple big anti-money laundering uh, new mechanisms that they've introduced recently in the past couple months. I think at the end of October or end of September or maybe beginning of October, the new National Economic Crime Center uh, was launched and began operating. So they'll be focusing on economic crimes such as money laundering. There is also uh, some new reforms in the UK regarding uh, some mechanisms that people would use for tax evasion or um, tax avoidance, including Scottish limited partnerships and limited partnerships and some of the rules about the transparency of ownership of those vehicles. And so, so all these scandals over the past decade are producing some results in the fight against money laundering 
and drawing attention to money laundering that will hopefully result in um, a decrease in money laundering. And uh, one of the takeaways for fraud examiners of these scandals and the reaction to them is that uh, when there are new reforms and new regulations, fraud examiners need to make sure that they and their organizations are staying in compliance with any new requirements of those reforms and regulations. And also keep in mind that some of those new uh, enforcement bodies like the National Economic Crime Center could potentially be a good resource for fraud examiners in the countries where they operate uh, in terms of pushing out information or um, notification of new trends and schemes and things like that. So it's always good to stay aware of not only these scandals, but the responses to them. And um, I guess it ended up coming out that uh, the main prompt for those Deutsche Bank raids was revelations in the Panama Papers data leak that you may remember from a couple years ago. So in case you aren't familiar with those or don't remember the details, the Panama Papers was a leak of information from a Panama Panamanian law firm that set up offshore companies and shell companies for different people around the world to help them move funds and potentially avoid taxes and things like that. And uh, so it was more than 11 and a half million documents that were leaked to a German journalist named Bastian Obermeier. I probably mispronounced that, but bear with me. And anyways, uh, that journalist shared those documents with a network of investigative journalists around the world called the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists that included more than 200 journalists across more than 70 countries that helped analyze these 11 and a half million records to produce some takeaways and some reporting on what, what the documents contained. Now, there were some pretty recognizable names and figures implicated in those documents that uh, you can go to the ICIJ, that's the International Consortium of Inter in Investigative Journalists. You can go to their website at icij.org and not only do they have a number of really valuable in-depth stories about the documents and the information they contained, but they also have a searchable database with all those Panama Papers documents, as well as the subsequent data leak, the Paradise Papers, which was another 1.4 terabytes of data or so with similar information involving a different firm involved with similar activities. So anyways, the Panama Papers was in the news recently not just for the Deutsche Bank raid but also the US Department of Justice issued or filed charges against four individuals in the first incident of them issuing charges related to the Panama Papers. It included two Monsat, Mossack Fonseca employees, uh, one Mossack Fonseca client and a lawyer. These charges included wire fraud tax fraud, money laundering, and failure to register uh, foreign bank accounts, and among a few others, including conspiracy to do some of those aforementioned things. And <clears throat> so the one of the significant takeaways there is that this, it's taken two years just to get the first four charges from the US Department of Justice with so many more names and so many more documents out there, this could just be the beginning of a number of criminal charges related to the Panama Papers. So even though it's been a while since those documents leaked, we could be seeing effects for a long time. And as I mentioned, that searchable database, that can potentially be a really valuable resource for fraud examiners that are involved with compliance investigations or due diligence investigations 
because it's a 100% free resource and very thorough. So you can go there, it's very user friendly uh, and you can look up the names of individuals and entities that were mentioned in these data leaks and that could be potentially relevant to any number of different investigations fraud examiners are involved in. So don't forget about that at ICIJ.org and expect more news about Panama Papers to be coming out for the near and medium term. So speaking of leaks of data and information, another big story recently was Marriott suffering a data breach that uh, apparently started in 2014 at Starwood Hotels, a brand that Marriott acquired in 2016. And with that acquisition, they unfortunately uh, acquired some IT issues that allowed for unauthorized access to a lot of sensitive information for a lot of clients. This is one of the more high profile data breaches recently. There were more than 500 million customers affected. Uh, and among those 500 million affected customers, I believe it was somewhere north of 320 million customers who had sensitive data compromised in the data breach. So that could, that included in that sensitive data was, or sensitive information, were names, date of birth, addresses, credit card information, and even passport numbers, which is kind of a big deal and not a very common occurrence in these data breaches. So I'm sure you're well aware of all the potential uses of that sensitive personal, personal information with identity theft uh, being at the very top of the list. There's a lot of different things that cyber fraudsters, if you will, can do with all that information. So that, that data breach has a number of implications for all the customers, but also one of the big things to keep an eye on with this case will be whether or not the GDPR is enforced because the GDPR includes data breach notification requirements. Um, there's some gray area language in those requirements, but uh, Hypothetically, this case could uh, could be covered by the GDPR because surely among those 500 million customers, there were EU citizens involved. And any company that processes sensitive information or personal information for EU citizens is supposedly required to notify the supervisory authorities uh, of the data breach within 72 hours of them discovering it. And apparently Marriott uh, discovered this data breach in September, I believe, but only recently were authorities notified. So theoretically, that could be a candidate for enforcement of the GEPR, which went into effect in May, but hasn't had any super high profile fines or enforcements yet. And uh, there's, it, there is potential that the Marriott tries to argue for any penalties to be enforced based on the, any any regulations that preceded the GDPR since the, the, access, the unauthorized access began in 2014. But there's, a, there's no real clear indication exactly what is gonna happen in terms of GDPR in this Marriott data breach. So uh, given how high profile it is, there's a very good chance that whatever does happen, whether they enforce GDPR fines or go with previous uh, previous regulations, this could be a, a significant precedent going forward uh, with other similar data breaches. So uh, something worth keeping an eye on for fraud examiners that are concerned with the ramifications and enforcement of the GDPR since it's still a relatively fresh, fresh regulation. And then moving on from there, 
Uh, we want to talk about a couple more fun and entertaining topics, which are from some stories from our Can't Make This Fraud Up files. You may have seen some, some of these Can't Make This Fraud Up stories in our Fraud Examiner newsletter. But uh, we start off with a very interesting case in China involving the annual Shanghai homing pigeon race. Apparently, two gentlemen participating in the race managed to cheat in the race by training their four homing pigeons to fly to a location by a high-speed train, at which point they smuggled those pigeons onto the high-speed train and took a shortcut to the finish line. And uh, their four pigeons, coincidentally, finished first, second, third, and fourth. Now, they would have been able to win a $160,000 prize by committing this fraud, but some, particip some other participants and some observers, I'm sure it was a very popular competition with lots of observers, uh, raised some questions about how quickly their pigeons managed to finish the race, and they refused to, or they declined to accept the prize money based on those questions but ended up being charged with fraud, a fraud charge in a Shanghai court and having to pay a fine. So um, who knew that uh, homing pigeon racing was such a serious sport that people would be willing to go to those lengths to, to commit fraud to, to win, but uh, apparently there are lots of very interesting pigeon subcultures and pigeon enthusiasts around the world. So um, I doubt they will be trying to get away with that again, however, and maybe it will bring more attention to the serious epidemic of cheating in pigeon races. Uh, moving on from there, this is actually another story out of China in which a local government uh, official was found to have committed more than 520 fraud offenses over a 10-year period uh, involving essentially embezzling funds in the local government funds. Now what makes this story kind of stand out and got a couple of chuckles from some of us around the office were that this gentleman, upon being found out, said that he never even expected to get away with the fraud because his methods were so primitive and he has no idea why he wasn't caught because he, he pretty much expected to be. Now some of these methods included at just straight up using whiteout to cover up a couple numbers on invoices. Um, and so apparently those were not placed under a ton of scrutiny and then in addition to that, one of the other tacti tactics mentioned in the article that we'll be sharing in the comments here is that uh, he purchased fake invoices online that didn't even match up with the official bank invoices that he was forging. So apparently not a lot of scrutiny involved in this case because he was able to get away with it for 10 years and um, get more than $5 million in proceeds from the fraud. So just look out for whiteout on, on the forms you're examining because uh, apparently uh, that can be enough to get away with it in some places. But then probably our favorite one of these can't make this fraud up stories for this edition is the case of two uh, employees of a Catholic school in Torrance, California. You may have seen this that uh, allegedly embezzled more than half a million dollars over a period of years from the Catholic school's tuition funds. And uh, there are some indications that they used these embezzled funds to take a number of trips to Vegas to gamble. Uh, so apparently they, they took a couple tuition checks and over the years and would hold them aside and deposit them into an alternative bank account that nobody else knew about and just use, use that bank account as their personal travel funds. Uh, I, I believe these nuns were described as best friends and 
they explained away their trips to Vegas by saying one of them had a very rich uncle and that they were visiting a friend from seminary or from Catholic, their own experience in Catholic school. I can't remember the exact detail on that. But anyways, they were eventually found out thanks to, uh, among other things, uh, an anonymous tip from the community. And so they were eventually found out and uh, their, you might say their bad habits were exposed. So on that wonderfully cheesy pun, uh, I think we're going to wrap up this edition. I hope you enjoyed it. Please submit any questions that you have or share any, any additional resources in the comments. And feel free to let us know if there's anything you'd like us to add into the next edition, which should be sometime around mid-January. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day.